So good evening, everyone, and welcome to our thematic panel series, which is titled Across the Table, which is part of the public consultations for India's Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy 2020. We are very glad to have our eminent panelists, our entrusted viewers, and the spirited team behind this unique initiative. I, myself, Divya Singh from Science Policy Forum, and I will be moderating this session today with my co-host, Mauva Chakravarti from DST Secretariat. We have Aditya, our colleague at Science Policy Forum. So basically, briefing you about the discussion. The discussion today is divided into two rounds. In the first 45 minutes to one hour, we will be hearing from our panelists on the relevance of the theme health and STI in the context of upcoming STEP 2020 which will be then followed by a round of question and answers coming from the general public who are watching this live streaming today. And uh, to quickly brief you, how are you going to reach us? The evening and the hashtag for asking the question today is Ask Step 2020 Health. So thank you all again uh, for joining us this evening. And I will take now this opportunity to quickly introduce you to our eminent panelists today. We first have Dr. Shalja Gupta, who is a senior advisor at the Office of Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. In her earlier capacities, she has taken up some very challenging roles with the Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, where she was handling international scientific collaboration and was responsible for establishing some very active bilateral, bilateral collaborations with countries like Netherlands, Canada, and Denmark. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. We next on our panelist, we have Dr. Manisha Sridhar, who is the regional advisor with the World Health Organization. She's actively contributed to the area of health diplomacy, intellectual property rights, and public health. Thank you, and we welcome you, Dr. Manisha Sridhar. We next have as our eminent panelist, Dr. K. Srinath Reddy, who is presently the President, Public Health Foundation of India, and was formerly heading the Department of Cardiology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. Dr. Reddy brings with himself his vast experience in the capacity building in the health sector in India through education, training, research, policy development, and health communication and advocacy. We are also expecting some esteemed members from us, ICMR to join us later this evening. And as and when they join us, we'll update you. So with that, I would like to invite our audience to ask their questions on YouTube and uh, following this hashtag. And now I invite Dr. Shagun Basra from the Office of Principal Scientific Advisor, Government of India, for briefing us on this activity today. Over to Dr. Shagun Basha. Uh, glad that uh, we have these wonderful individuals with us today, uh, interacting with the larger set of audience that we are going to uh, have for the next two hours. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, this policy process has started with a very uh, small set of uh, deliberation, and then it is now moving towards a, a larger participatory experience where uh, we are having multiple tracks running in parallel, and then like trying to get stakeholder voices in every every uh, aspect of this policy. Uh, so I just wanted to quickly jump in here to few say a few words on behalf of the STIP 2020 Secretariat, which is. Uh, an entity created by the Office of Principal Scientific Advisor and Department of Science and Technology to take care of this complete policy process. So as part of the track one, which is the public consultation and extended expert consultation, uh, we are having this 15-part uh, thematic panel series. I'm not going to call it webinar because that's beaten to death. Everybody said, like, don't call it webinar anymore. So we are going to call it thematic panel series, which is actually a public panel. Uh, the first one to kick start with is on a very important topic today, health and STI. And again, I'm really, really glad that we have these wonderful individuals who have contributed to this, uh, both from the, the health perspective as from the science and technology perspective uh, with us today to deliberate. So the primary uh, objective of this panel here is to connect our experts to the tracking process, like the track drafting process, which is the track two in the STIP 2020, also to have the larger voices, larger set of voices through the public participation <laughs> reflect into the policy making process. So that makes it a truly participatory in its sense. So with that, I'll hand it over to Divya to, to actually take the session forward. Thank you so much. 
And, and now with this, I now quickly invite my co-moderator, Mawa, for initiating the panel discussion now. Over to you, Mawa. Thanks, Divya and Chagun, for setting up the stage. I'm extremely excited to start, start the discussion session with our esteemed panelists who have joined us tonight. So to move towards our theme of the meeting today, uh, historically, if we see, health has always been one of the most important sectors in STI policy making. However, the ongoing COVID situ situation makes it even more relevant as we get to witness how a single disease can affect the state of functioning of an entire nation and in fact of the whole world. So in this context, we look forward to getting some valuable insights from our experts on how the upcoming STI policy can help leverage science, technology, and innovation to enable accessible and affordable healthcare for the nation. So with this theme, um, I'd like to start the session. I'd like to request Dr. Gupta to share her thoughts on this. Over to, over to you, Dr. Gupta. Dr. Gupta, could you please unmute yourself? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mama, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here on this. Uh, what did you call it, Shagun? Not a webinar. <laughs> uh, but uh, one, of this, <laughs> one of the series uh, to develop our STI um, policy. Uh, the COVID situation, like Mama said, has actually exposed a lot uh, of how important healthcare and policies related to healthcare is to a country and to the world in general. Uh, and uh, 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 what we have sitting here in this office, what we have learned is that um, though we did come up together and did manage to get a lot of things uh, running in uh, very rapid speed. There was a lot which was lacking within our system which could have been uh, placed better and which could have been dealt better. These, uh, the lessons which we have learned uh, during the COVID crisis are very important and should not be lost upon us. The biggest lesson which we have learned is that we do not have any our manufacturing capacity because of the break in the supply uh, chain we realized the manufacturing capacity within India is a lot which needs uh, to be uh, a lot which uh, which is uh, to be desired. And uh, the second thing which has come out prominently is regu the regulatory aspect in healthcare. It is completely exposed. It is something which we need to pull up our socks, rehaul and reinvent if we want to uh, not let a pandemic uh, sort of uh, cripple us in the future. Our regulatory processes have to be put in place and uh, we need to be a little bit, work with them more foresight if uh, we have to um, uh, be prepared for uh, the world of a future. This is not the first pandemic and this is not likely to be the last pandemic uh, uh, the world will face. We will, uh, uh, given the kind of uh, um, uh, how we have dealt with the environment and how we have uh, dealt with the whole system, uh, our ecosystem out there, this is not going to be the last uh, um, uh, pandemic that the world will see. Uh, and healthcare is not an isolated vertical. It is uh, interconnected with the environment, the ecosystem, the waste, the uh, agriculture, the nutrition, uh, the every aspect of everything else uh, affects uh, healthcare, whether it's the pollution, whether it is um, environment, uh, everything is affecting healthcare. There is nothing as uh, an isolationist healthcare policy. We, it has to look at the whole spectrum uh, and uh, that is how we are going to come into a, a policy which will be more effective and is not just there in paper and which means 
nothing to anything else but a few pieces of paper. We have to look at a strategy which is more outcome oriented, which is implementable and not uh, just words. One aspect of uh, the innovation system which we have been looking, the design and when we looked at the uh, the ventilators, the PPEs, the um, uh, masks which uh, were required during the COVID crisis, we realized that there was capacity to uh, come up for various people to come together and have a workable solution. What they did not have was a regulatory process. They didn't know where to get the certification done, where to get the validation done, and where to get uh, bring uh, how to bring that uh, idea and that prototype into market. Uh, the other thing which is completely lacking in most of our healthcare uh, sector, and in fact most of our uh, any manufacturing thing, is the design. It's completely neglected, uh, completely uh, uh, not even somewhere in our consciousness. The design of a product. Uh, th these are very vast, so I, I'm covering uh, a large uh, range of aspects which need to be covered in a healthcare policy, but we'll uh, go about it in a more detailed way uh, when uh, we have a more detailed uh, discussion. I'm just setting the stage uh, to the kind of discussions we can have over uh, uh, this one hour and a half or uh, two hours, uh, but uh, I will... Uh, come back to you again on this. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for giving an amazing insight into the connectedness of STI and healthcare in current perspective. In fact, uh, the hand-holding of the innovation sector, the, uh, sector that you brought up, uh, I think we will definitely want to hear from you more on that, and we'll come back to you for that. Uh, so with that, um, I would request Dr. Reddy to kindly share from your wife in the field of public health. Dr. Reddy, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I fully echo the thought that uh, health is actually determined by influences in multiple sectors which coalesce together to impact upon human health. So when we are looking at all the determinants of health which act at the population level to ultimately impact on in health at the individual level, then we do require interdisciplinary learning, which can translate into multisectoral action. Unfortunately, that has been missing so far, but I believe the science and technology and innovation policy can form the bridge between multiple disciplines, which can actually promote health in all dimensions. But coming to health in particular, in the context of both public health and the healthcare system, it is very critical that we look at what our national health policy of 2017 and our sustainable development goals of 2030 are, which are very closely interrelated. So we are looking at health across the life course and health in all dimensions for all people in terms of health and well-being. And there we are looking at health promotion, disease prevention, as well as diagnosis, early detection and care, rehabilitation and palliative care. And in every one of these areas, we have an opportunity for advancing science and technology and innovations for delivering much more effective services. Taking in primary health care as the first piece, which is the fundamental basis of a sound health system, whether it is health promotion at the community level or delivery of essential health care services across the board, whether it is reproductive, maternal, neonatal and child health services, or non-communicable diseases, or mental health, or virtually every other element that is embedded in the Sustainable Development Goal 3, we definitely need to focus much more on primary health care, with, of course, adequate con connectivity to uh, secondary and tertiary care as needed in a bi-directional manner. So this is where we require science and technology to come up with much met be better methods of both providing early alerts for infections in terms of providing an opportunity for diseases to be detected early in terms of outbreaks, as well as immediate outbreak investigation, contact tracing, and 
these can come in from standard surveillance systems such as the integrated disease surveillance program it can also come in from crowdsourcing of data pharmaco surveillance and how we can actually integrate all of this data quickly for a ready and rapid response is going to be critical uh, the whole area of one health comes in particularly in the context of zoonotic diseases like covid-19 where we have to combine the whole area of ecology and environment uh, and uh, the whole uh, transmission chain from wildlife uh, to vet captive veterinary populations to human habitat and therefore the concept of one health again brings in multiple disciplines together but again as we try and gather data at multiple levels of the health system we need to get the data collection systems which are much more efficient but at the same time easy to operate with considerable degree of interoperability as well and producing icon based software for the frontline health workers and is going to make it much easier to collect a lot of data on the spot and then transmit it later on for analysis as well as for possible teleconsultations so going to be important elements how we weave in the good data gathering systems into different levels of healthcare but keeping primary healthcare as the basis as uh, the fundamental basis similarly even for non communicable diseases like diabetes and hypertension we now recognize how technology enabled primary healthcare providers can actually control uh, blood sugar and blood pressure very effectively in the front lines but urban primary healthcare has been one neglected area and we have seen the problems related to that even in our response to covid so that is where we again need to focus a lot of attention and then enable a much better use of science and technology and innovation both for rural primary health care and uh, urban primary health care with customized variations as required but definitely making technology enabled non physician health care providers as the principal agents of delivery but even in terms of health promotion in school and workplace based uh, settings it becomes absolutely important but we are also going to be seeing different changes in care delivery not only in terms of greater self care and patient empowerment but also virtual care telemedicine usage of telephone calls secure emails video visits internet based psychotherapy all of these will emerge but how are they going to be developed in a efficient and equitable manner with appropriate controls for privacy protection these are going to be some of the challenges of technology but we cannot talk about health without talking about nutrition and therefore linking nutrition across the life course whether it is under nutrition or inappropriate nutrition leading to overweight and obesity which are also linked quite closely together and even in covid-19 we recognize that our innate immunity is essentially linked to our nutrition and of course some other habits like uh, physical activity and sleep and so on but nutrition is pivotal and how do we actually link our agriculture and food systems to meet our health and nutrition goals is going to be an important element of the future at the same time recognizing our food and agriculture systems will have to be both also climate efficient and climate resilient and therefore from that point of view we have to really focus on science and uh, agriculture and food systems not as a separate element of commerce but as an essential element of health and nutrition and given india's variability we also need to look at how indian diets actually the varied indian diets have an influence on epigenetics the microbiome and how we can actually we develop much more protective mechanisms which can protect us both against infectious diseases and against chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension which unfortunately are very uh, very prevalent in india at the moment now of course we do require Uh, to focus on efficiency and equity as we are developing universal health coverage and here we have to talk about both horizontal equity as well as vertical equity where horizontal equity is where all services are available to everybody and vertical equity is used to bridge the existing gaps of equity between different sections and here we do definitely need to pay attention to all sections of society but i think the important element is also to ensure that our research is much more oriented towards the problem solving and therefore we need demand responsive research we need knowledge sharing platforms we need community 
based participatory research, both quantitative and qualitative elements being taken into account. And therefore, that needs to be a much more uh, closer link with actual implementation research as well. So these are some of the thoughts I have. Uh, I will not uh, really elaborate much more except to say that science and technology are capable of providing transdisciplinary bridges across multiple disciplines, which can solve many problems related to health, right from prevention to palliation. And therefore, across the continuum of health services, across the continuum of life course, science and technology can play a great role. But in the Indian context, we need to specifically focus on how we can find uh, appropriate and affordable technologies which can actually promote both efficiency and equity in addressing the very many problems that we have. And the more people we can reach through these innovations and in a more affordable manner, the greater our success in this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, thank you really, sir, for raising some very important issues across wide spectrum of healthcare, interdisciplinary learning, public health care, disease surveillance data collection you have almost touched all the spectrum of healthcare uh, and we really expect our audiences would like to engage with you in some of these topics uh, so thank you sir for that taking this forward i would request dr sridhar to kindly share her thoughts on this from her wide experience in health diplomacy dr sridhar please go ahead yeah thank you and uh, i have to thank uh, the the entire science and technology innovation team for getting us on board and the engagement that we had in our group and the subgroup has also been very encouraging because it was very uh, heartening to note the kind of enthusiasm with which the entire group is moving forward. Having said this, I it is science and technology innovation policy has the capacity to actually knit together in many more ways than it is possible for individual departments or domain areas to do so and go ahead you mentioned about health diplomacy it is uh, uh, one of the very interesting uh, aspects which came up in terms of our work here in the southeast asia regional office is that some of the smaller countries have been requesting for drugs and medical supplies. And often their quantities are extremely small. For example, if we look at uh, uh, Maldives and we look at HIV AIDS, their numbers are something in the range of 256 to 300, 300 people. And this is the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, antiretrovirals that need to be provided to uh, uh, this kind of population is not a difficult task uh, to be maintained by India. And it could really help in long term in terms of health diplomacy and build a very positive equation among the neighborhood. Having said that, I think uh, uh, the context of India itself in terms of the STIP policy is very critical and many of the issues have been mentioned by both Shalaja and Dr. Vedi. In fact, when we look at the, uh, uh, the tripartite collaboration that has taken place between WHO, Food and Agriculture Organization and the OIE, which is the organization responsible. Um, I think we lost uh, Dr. Manisha's connection, maybe. Um, I think she got disconnected, some network issues at her end. Uh, so maybe we'll wait for a minute. Um, or maybe uh, Dr. Reddy, would you like to just fill in for a bit till she comes back? Uh, sir, could you please unmute your mic? Yes, thank you, sir. Okay, one of the elements that we really need to look at is how we gather, analyze data quickly for problem solving. We need data which are both disaggregated, at the same time can be coalesced across multiple data sources at multiple levels for analysis at different levels. 
for different types of decision making. Uh, we need relevant, representative, and real-time data. And how do we gather it at different levels? And how do we actually set in motion local information loops for sharing the knowledge so that we can quickly initiate action? And these loops, of course, will extend at different levels, at the community level, at the primary health care level, at the state capital or district level, and then at the national level. But unless we get our data acquisition and analytic capacity in order, we'll always be behind in terms of policy making and programmatic response. Even in terms of COVID, we are seeing how lack of ready available data sometimes hinders us. So I think it's very important for science, technology, and innovation to look at how best we can actually improve our data acquisition and analytic capacity. Thank you, sir, for raising this very important issue on data collection. Uh, in fact, uh, while we are also uh, starting this evidence-based policy making uh, through STIP 2020, in fact, we also face this issue of that uh, of uh, data availability. So your thoughts really come uh, here that data availability for policy making and data availability for decision making in healthcare as well. Okay, if I may so, modify that a little, yes, I would sir. say what we should be aiming for is evidence informed, context relevant, resource sensitive, culturally compatible, and <laughs> equity promoting recommendations for policy and practice. That's what data and research should be used for. I think I'd like to add one more aspect to it. We have data and we have evidence for policy, the data. The data, how we communicate the data to the people is very important. And we have not been able to communicate uh, science based on data to our masses in a language which the masses understand it. And it is in, in, in a completely um, uh, diverse uh, con uh, country like uh, India, where we have uh, and a complex country like uh, India. It is so important to be able to con com com communicate the uh, outcomes of data uh, well to our uh, population in various languages and it is uh, the design of uh, uh, science is, uh, is equally important. The one thing I would like to take up from what uh, uh, Dr. Reddy said earlier and uh, he uh, talked about what are the, uh, how to redo science and we should be looking at uh, science which is more relevant and problem solving science. And in, in the STI uh, policy, I think we should also pose some really big research questions which are relevant to India. He talked about microbiome and Indian diets, whether it gives us inherent or innate uh, immunity uh, or not. I think that's a big uh, science question. We need to uh, look at it. And uh, I think some efforts are already being initiated by the Department of Biotechnology for the microbiome and nutritional uh, aspects of the Indian population. What uh, we need to do is look at more uh, such science questions, which uh, could be more relevant to the Indian population. Uh, Manish has joined us, but I just finished this and, uh, uh, and then we'll go back to Manisha. Yeah. I, I, and there are some questions which I have been wondering about whether uh, we look at cancer incidents in India. And uh, I've been talking to Dr. Pramesh, uh, for director um, Tata Memorial Hospital. Uh, and uh, I've been asking us, do we underreport cancer uh, incidents in India? He says, Shanti, if it was about 10%, 20%, it would have been OK. We have 300% less than world average. We're catching up soon, but we still have about 200 to 300% less than the world average. 
what is it? Is it our diets? Is it our uh, genetics? What is it? These are big science questions. And uh, uh, people like uh, Dr. Reddy and Chandrasekhar will come in from ICMR, real specialists, real uh, healthcare people are better people to pose these real questions, big science questions. And I think it is important as agencies, as science agencies, to put, uh, pose this big science uh, uh, questions within our STI so that we, uh, the agencies, the country as a whole is able to uh, work towards answering questions which are relevant to us, our population and our, uh, our, our, uh, our ecosystem. So with that, I will uh, let Manisha take over. Dr. Dr. Manisha, while we had lost your connection. We were discussing about uh, data in healthcare. Uh, so coming back to you, Dr. Manisha, please continue your discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you. In fact, there has been a far uh, uh, complete uh, blackout here. So I have connected on my personal hotspot and I have kept my fingers crossed, hoping that I don't have more uh, issues. But anyway, I just wanted to, uh, in this context, uh, raise two more points. One that when we talked about uh, the uh, tripart engagement, and we also looked at AMR. We did not actually look at viruses and how in the COVID-19 situation we find that it is jumping across uh, from the wet market. So when we look at science and innovation and how science can influence in terms of our moving ahead, a wider engagement is, re is needed rather than uh, just to focus uh, on terms of uh, uh, products and and, and services. So a health systems engagement across, and this is something which the science and technology innovation policy can bring on board. When you look at, at the whole systems innovation and, and the ecosystem uh, uh, where innovation rests and how it can move forward. And in this context, I, I, I think we also need to bear in mind, there's a lot of another area where we feel that science needs to really come on board is in terms of alternative health care. There is so much information that is available and it needs to be linked with the scientific knowledge and information. That they, are, they have been making over a period of time. And the issue of regulatory science did come up. And it is not only important in terms of our products and services and the issue of uh, PPEs and CE marking is something that we are dealing with on a daily basis because of the COVID-19. But regulatory science uh, as a whole, there needs to be innovation in the science itself. And it is interesting how we are looking at vaccine development and crunching the time periods of, of the science. Uh, we took many, many years to have the polio vaccines or the measles vaccines, even Ebola vaccine took about five years, but now we are trying to crunch that and do it in, in a year or a year and a half. And so how the science needs to respond is also something that the science and technology innovation policy can address. And while I'm at this, I want to share with you that science and innovation it has such a large bandwidth. I remember that when I was a very uh, young officer and we were interacting with a group of women and they compl complained regularly of backache. And people, we, we thought it was something to do with nutrition and then people thought it was something to do with uh, their, uh, uh, their problems in terms of uh, women and child health areas. But eventually it was interesting to note that it was for a very, when, when we did a bit of a study, it was because of the very heavy agricultural implements that they were lifting to actually do the job in the, in the fields. And then we engaged with the University of Rurki at that time and they were actually able to produce implements which were lighter and, and had a better uh, design uh, for the women. So it is something that, that uh, when we look at the gamut of science and innovation policy, often it cannot be even written into the policy. There is so much scope for science and we need to put the innovation and science and free it up so that all these uh, 
um, uh, the scientific temperament that is there in our country actually addresses all of these. And while I, I, I am at this, I, I was just wondering when, I, uh, when we were looking at also, we have had very detailed discussions in our uh, STIP group. Can, can, our, can the group itself, can the innovation come even in terms of how we are thinking in terms of the science policy? And the reason I say this is that if you look at the way the world is today, things have changed in many ways. So you look at Uber or you look at uh, Ola cabs or even uh, 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 we find that they don't really own the infrastructure but they are able to deliver services and that's a new way of doing things. We have almost 400 plus universities in our country with some of the most brilliant people. We have infrastructure. Can the innovation policy look at health and innovation and, and actually gear up the whole system in a way that, that has happened in terms of these innovative uh, arrangements that took place, like the Airbnb, for, for instance. So uh, there is so much scope, and, and I, I think it's very heartening to note the way uh, the tracks are coming together. Uh, and uh, a lot has been mentioned on the UHC and the SDG goals. In fact, uh, when I was in Kazakhstan for the primary healthcare meeting, a lot of discussion took place in how innovation is, is needed across a very large varying uh, set of parameters for primary healthcare. And a lot of this was also built in and reiterated in the UN high level meeting on universal health coverage, which took place just last year in New York. But it is important to note that we link the, the goals of the SDGs and our aspirations back to the, uh, to the ground reality where they belong. And I, I am quite uh, hopeful that the way this, uh, the, uh, the larger, uh, uh, the collaboration and bringing together of different tracks is happening. It, this uh, science and technology innovation policy will really uh, enthuse uh, uh, in the science and innovation uh, within our country. So over to you and thank you for your patience and, and my connection as well. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Sridhar. Uh, thank you really for giving us a detailed insight into the present landscape of health diplomacy and bringing up so many important issues such as system innovation, alternative healthcare, innovation in regulatory science, and so many other things. Uh, and also citing your wide field experience and other practical examples. It's really always a pleasure to listen to your insights. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank all of our panelists for their detailed insights. And um, uh, I think we got really nice vision of the importance of STI in various domains of healthcare. So with this, we will move to our next part of the session. And I would like to invite my co-moderator, Divya, could you please take us to the next part of the session? Right, Divya? Yes. yes. Thank you very much, Mawa. I'm a, so I'm audible. Isn't it? Yes. Yes. So uh, you rightly said this was a completely a brief and a crisp overview of how we can revamp uh, the system. And I, I think we have almost covered all of the uh, aspects, starting from manufacturing, regulatory, the universal coverage. So uh, I'll what we now uh, move on is the next part of the session, which is the public question and answer session. On and uh, we now will be posing to our panelists the questions that we have received on our uh, forum, the uh, discussion forum, and the questions that we are coming, taking from the YouTube. So, and yes, I just remind our audiences also, you can quickly send in your questions using our hashtag for today, which is Ask Step 2020 Health. So uh, the first question, Dr. Reddy, I will like you uh, to comment on this. And uh, so this is basically the domain uh, which is primary health care and uh, looking at it in the present perspective, which is the COVID situation. So basically the need to revamp the primary health care India has always been talked about in the policy arena. And the ongoing COVID situation has made us feel this lacuna even before than before. I mean, even more. So how do you think Dr. Reddy could be the ways for revamping our primary health care system? So over to you, Dr. Well, uh, primary health care, uh, well, Primary health care actually is the fundamental basis of any well-functioning health system and particularly necessary for delivering universal health coverage. 
which again embraces all aspects of health. And for that, we can actually look at both how services are delivered by healthcare personnel, as well as we promote health awareness and the ability for self-care in the community. And in both of these areas, science and technology and innovation can play a great role. So when we are talking, for example, about delivery of services by frontline healthcare workers, uh, in terms of uh, whether it is the ASHAs or the auxiliary nurse midwives or the mid-level healthcare providers, how can they be actually enabled and empowered through technology for performing these functions much better? And as I mentioned, even diabetes and hypertension have been very well uh, managed in uh, the state of Himachal Pradesh by auxiliary nurse midwives holding handheld devices in which decision support systems were embedded. And for 18 months, they managed to control blood, blood sugar and blood pressure very well. Similarly, following up on antenatal care, all of these are important elements which are already been tested, but they need to be made much more extensive. And we can actually enable a lot of services to be delivered at the front line in primary health care. But also, even in terms of empowering the community uh, in uh, different settings, community-based setting for self-care, self-awareness, better health awareness, how do we actually bridge the knowledge gap? Uh, how do we ensure that in schools and workplaces, we actually also have greater opportunity for both for health promotion and early detection? So in a number of ways, primary health care can be extended across different settings involving all the players, whether it is the participation of the community itself or more enabled primary health care delivery workforce. So this is where actually science and technology and innovation can come forth much more strongly. Thank you, Dr. Reddy, for your valuable insights to this. Uh, well, uh, moving to the next question, I think, uh, Dr. Gupta, I'll reach out to you for this. Uh, 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 so because, um, OK, so the question goes, how timely science advice can help in taking major informed policy decisions, particularly within a, during a health crisis such as this? Uh, so I think, Dr. Gupta, you are coming from the Apex Science Advisory Office of the country, and so we would like to hear your comments on this. Over to you, Dr. Gupta. Uh, if I understand you correctly, Mahua, is you want me to say how timely uh, uh, advice from a yes. foreign agency can uh, help us deal with the crisis better? Yes. So basically what they're asking is that how timely science advice can help in taking major policy decisions during a health crisis. Yes. yes. It's a very controversial uh, question, uh, Mama. And we have seen the repercussions of uh, not having timely uh, advice being given by agencies, uh, creating an impact on the world which could have been avoided and Manisha is here, uh, and it's a, a much controversial and a debated question about whether WHO could have advised the world uh, prior to when they did, uh, two years, uh, two months advance uh, um, advisory may have uh, uh, mitigated the outcome of uh, the pandemic. Uh, it, it's again a question which uh, can be debated and we don't know the real answers. So yes, uh, given uh, our uh, what we have seen right now and what we have uh, uh, experienced globally, that staying in denial uh, of a situation which is uh, which is. Uh, uh, which we are seeing in the face is something which we should not do. Uh, we should not do it to protect governments. We should not do that to uh, protect leadership. We should be able to face the problem and say, yes, there is a problem. Yes, there are uh, things which we need to set right. And yes, we need to deal with them. Uh, I think 
primarily why uh, the advisories are not given in time is because uh, the agencies are trying to protect themselves, the governments, uh, uh, somebody somewhere has to be protected and uh, so that the image is not tarnished. Their, um, the uh, right message is sent out to the public. Uh, and it's a very human thing to do, but I think it's not uh, in the interest of the world. It's not in, in the interest of the country. We should be taking uh, decisions very quickly uh, with whatever evidence we have uh, and uh, the right um, facts and figures should be placed on uh, board. That is my personal opinion. I think uh, advisories well in time will definitely, definitely uh, help prevent disasters. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. That actually makes a lot of sense. And uh, obviously, the present situation has kind of uh, made us understand also the importance of how timely scientific advice should come up. I now will move to Dr. Uh, Sridhar, and I, since she mentioned about the SDG 2030 goals and the universal health coverage, Dr. Manisha, I would like to hear from you. How do you think, or what do you think could be the enablers uh, which could help the new STI science policy to play an important role in achieving these goals, this SDG 2030 and the universal health coverage? Thank you for the question. And I also want to, in the context of what has been said uh, prior to this, make a mention that uh, WHO is actually a, a member state driven organization. So we are a secretariat to the member states. So very often, uh, uh, we, what, how WHO deals or accepts resolutions, including those on universal health coverage or on sustainable development goals, is what the member states decide and how the member states decide to move forward. And that includes movement, not only in terms of these uh, goals, but also uh, it, to a great extent on how uh, the information percolates uh, for instance, also in, in this ep epidemic. And I don't think uh, 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 the kind of pandemic that we have faced today is something that anybody ever envisaged is what is uh, going to, uh, uh, how it is going to fan out. We did look at uh, uh, issues uh, of uh, Ebola, as I had, uh, as we mentioned earlier, these were still contained uh, 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 epidemics. So, uh, some of the uh, uh, aspects need to be seen in, in, a, in the larger uh, context as well. And having mentioned this in terms of the sustainable development goals, it is, uh, uh, we, there are a certain number of monitoring parameters against which the, uh, the achievements of the 2030 agenda have been uh, outlined. The science and technology policy, as has been mentioned earlier, has uh, influences every part of the sustainable development goal, not just the health goal, because environment or energy or all the other aspects also built into healthy policies. In fact, when we uh, look at uh, the 2013 Health in All Policies uh, uh, Declaration, which took place in Helsinki, that really defines the scope of health in terms of science and technology innovation because it is across all policies of the government, whether they are in terms of housing policy, they, even the zoning requirements in terms of rural health, in terms of water and sanitation, which was the original public health goals. Uh, 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 in all the policy, it is, it is critical that uh, the science innovation and innovation policy builds in and contribute so that we get the maximum uh, traction from the policy in terms of population health and public health. And having said that, in terms of the uh, achievement of these goals, a greater emphasis also needs to be placed on the preventive part of healthcare. 
whether it is in terms of uh, nutrition and environment and uh, 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 other parameters, even hand hygiene and water and sanitation. These are critical to meet many of the sustainable development goals in turn, uh, uh, and, and the long-term uh, aspects, rather than uh, looking at uh, drug discovery and development, which is a very important part and a very important part when it comes to handling a disease. But this is also uh, uh, very critical in terms of uh, seeing a holistic picture in terms of the science and technology innovation policy. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for your detailed insights. Uh, both the points were very well taken. Uh, we have an interesting question on medical inclusivity, and I think uh, I would like to have Dr. Reddy's uh, comments on this. Uh, so the question is related to how do you think all policy, policies, and especially STI policy, should address the issue of equity and inclusivity in healthcare? Uh, here, I would like to add a little part from my own, which is I would also like to draw your attention when we talk about inclusivity. Uh, towards the less prevalent diseases, such as rare diseases, which usually tend to get ignored in most discussion of health, just because they affect a small fraction of population. So, Dr. Reddy, we would like to have your comments on that. Please. Uh, sure. Clearly, what we need in a competent and compassionate healthcare system is efficiency and equity both. And when we talk about equity, we are talking about equity in two dimensions. One is horizontal equity, which means that everybody gets the same assured set of services as a part of the essential package of services in universal health coverage. But at the same time, there are existing health gaps between various sections, particularly among the poor and the vulnerable. And we need to bridge those gaps, which is vertical equity. Therefore, you can have additional inputs in terms of resources, augmented services, or even additional financial coverage in whatever manner in order to bridge that, and that is vertical equity. But the way we actually select out the interventions in terms of best use of our limited resources is to do cost effectiveness as one of the instruments of choice. But it's not only cost effectiveness, but we have to look at equity considerations, particularly when we are looking at less common diseases, <clears throat> which affect people, but where life-saving interventions or life-enhancing interventions are very much required. And that is where we have to bring in the equity dimension as a moral imperative. And But that is a decision that is best taken collectively through social consensus. We have to ensure that, for example, children with treatable cancers or treatable diseases which may be otherwise impairing their life course, if effective treatments are available, even if there are relatively rare conditions, would have to be treated. Similarly, persons with disabilities. So we have to bring in that element of equity also, not just cost effectiveness. But these need to be balanced through a societal consensus which takes these choices in a very careful, deliberative manner. But I would certainly believe it is important that both dimensions of equity and cost effectiveness should be balanced. And we need to bring in both horizontal equity, which is universality, as well as vertical equity, which is bridging the gaps that exist between different sections of society. And may I be excused because I now have to join WHO Geneva for the Solidarity Trial Executive Committee. Yeah, yes, uh, as you already mentioned, Dr. Reddy, and it was a pleasure to have your uh, inputs. And uh, we could get that one hour, 55 minutes from you to have these inputs. Um, um, it is more than a pleasure to us. And we're looking forward to for further exchanges on the, the same team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you. So uh, before we move further into the question the session, I, we have our eminent panelists joining us from ICMR today, Dr. Chandrasekhar. I'll just briefly introduce him. 
uh, he is from Indian Council of Medical Research and he's presently the head of innovation and translational research in Indian Council of Medical Research. Dr. Chandrasekhar, we are glad to have you here. Welcome, sir. And uh, maybe, uh, yes. So uh, maybe, Mawa, if we can uh, have a quick uh, input from Dr. Chandrasekhar on uh, the present theme. Yes, I think, sure, Divya, that's a very good idea. <clears throat> Dr. Yes. Chandrasekhar, uh, we had just to brief you about what went on in the last uh, almost an hour. So we had brief uh, uh, remarks from all our panelists on STI and healthcare. So we would like to hear something from you on that regard. Over to you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Sir, could you please unmute your mic? Is it, is it yes, better sir. now? Yes, yeah, perfectly. Okay. Yeah, good evening. Uh, greetings from the Indian Council of Medical Research. We are the one of the oldest R&D organizations in the world. We were established in 1911. And over the years, we have come to a, a situation in which we have created a new division of innovation and translation research, realizing the potential of this in our country to be self-reliant and to be able to answer questions in a much, much more meaningful and a cost-effective manner. So this is, this is at present what at stage we are, and we are promoting innovations in terms of medical devices, diagnostics, and other treatment modalities, which could be used by the programs and the community at a cost which is affordable and which is accessible to them at different levels of healthcare. Dr. This would be my introductory remarks and as we go we will like to have more discussions and any answers that need to be required to be given from our side i'll be too happy to do that thank you sir that uh, was actually brief uh, and i now move to uh, dr shalja gupta and ma'am we we'll like to hear from you on a very uh, important question that we pose from our discussion from her be uh, based on your, uh, uh, so based, you have an extensive experience in some of the most challenging roles that you have taken. So based on your experience, what do you think are the most, could be the most destructive and out of the box ideas for revamping the present healthcare system in the relevance of STIP 2020? Um, <laughs> yes, you're audible now. Yeah. The most destructive idea would be raise this country down and restructure it all over again. <laughs> we really need to do that. But uh, given that that's not an option, what would be the most destructive idea to uh, for a more uh, for a better healthcare system in India? I think we have to uh, think. Uh, a little bit more, uh, be a little bit more ambitious, uh, be a little bit uh, uh, community level uh, engagement for healthcare is a good thing. Having ASHA worker is a good thing. Having a primary healthcare work is a good thing, but uh, that is not ambition. That is just uh, getting along, doing business as usual. If we have to break this uh, uh, status quo, so to speak, of healthcare. We have to be a little bit more ambitious as a country and provide healthcare, which is best comparable to the world. And that would mean setting up uh, primary healthcare in every district, every village, every town of India, which is comparable to the best in the world. Given that we have limited resources with the government, how to go about uh, creating these uh, health systems which are the best comparable to the best we have to uh, partner with the private organizations we have to partner with philanthropic uh, organizations we have to create a system which will uh, break the system, uh, the way we are functioning at this moment uh, we have to uh, look beyond the ministry of health we have to look beyond ministry uh, icmr and go out and partner with 
the private sector and create these health systems which uh, are um, affordable uh, but uh, comparable to the best in the world and are uh, accessible to anywhere uh, to any every citizen of this country uh, and it is a it is a possibility it is ambition it is uh, something which we need to get done uh, and uh, they could be primary healthcare centers uh, situated in every village every town uh, if not in every village every town every district every panchayat level whatever is the bare minimum start somewhere start somewhere and put these uh, systems in place uh, uh, and uh, the best way to go about is uh, collaborating with the private industry uh, with private organizations uh, i don't see max uh, hospitals and maybe chandra shekhar here will be able to tell us more i don't see max hospitals and apollo hospitals uh, uh, being set up in smaller towns and uh, villages can, can we have clinics uh, for, uh, apollo go government and apollo collaborations and set up these small cl clinics in towns uh, in villages in uh, towns small towns yeah. Uh, which have standard uh, and uh, good quality healthcare being provided to every uh, citizen of India. And like uh, Dr. Reddy said, which also look at the uh, horizontal and the vertical aspect, as that is providing quality healthcare to everyone, not just the privileged and the elite. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for raising a very important issue. And I think with this, um, I'd like to take forward this issue to uh, Dr. Chandra Shekhar, as you have uh, directed uh, towards him. And uh, also add a component of another question that has come from forward, which is about accessibility of healthcare. So moving like two questions blending together. One is whether Max and Apollo could be moved to smaller cities and how accessible they, could they be then? Uh, over to you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> the best answer. Sir, could you Chandra please Chandra unmute your uh, yeah, microphone? Yes, sir. Uh, Is it better? No. Yes, sir. Good. Yeah, for taking your question. I'm not too sure whether taking Max Fortis and Apollos to smaller towns and sub towns would be a good idea because there's a question of affordability. The people down those uh, towns and uh, small uh, uh, sub towns will not be in a very good position to afford the kind of medical care they are expected to provide, and they. Are let me button here. Let me button here. I wasn't saying just Max. I said we work the government collaborate with them and set up a joint public private hospital that is, there. That is, that is exactly what I, what I am coming to and driving my discussion is that instead of that we can have partners with private hospitals and other corporates who would be able to pitch in some money and some money being provided by the government at a, at a level in which we can decide on the cost and the affordability which many many people down in those areas are able to use. That would be a very, very good model. And also, now the government is also supplementing hospitals in district and sub-district level to make it more uh, uh, responsive to the needs of the uh, people in those areas. And in fact, the present efforts of the government in giving such a good quality infrastructure that now they are opening up postgraduate seats in these district, district hospitals which have established some kind of a credibility is a step in this direction. And I think as we move in years, more and more district hospitals will become eligible to be hosting the postgraduates in different subjects. That will percolate the good competence of the district hospital as well as supplemented by the postgraduates who would be improving the accessibility and the quality of care in these areas. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar. That was a quick input. And uh, we now move to Dr. Sridhar. And uh, this is a question that uh, has come from our social media. 
and we would like to hear from you how could innovation basically improve the overall health system so basically how sti policy can leverage innovation to improve our to the overall health system in india over to you dr shridhar uh, thank you for the question and i also compliment whoever asked this question because this is really i think critical to what the science and technology innovation policy should handle i would uh, uh, urge that when we look at innovation we look at the entire gamut of innovation so we when we look at innovation in terms of products and processes the kind of innovation and the kind of work that dr chandrashekhar and others do in icmr and and related institutions these are uh, typically product innovations so they are also looking at what we call the upstream and the research so research at the level of what are the new products that will come in the future and that is very critical because as you know uh, science is progressing at a very large scale so we hear about genomics and you can see how artificial intelligence uh, is being used uh, to discover new drugs uh, and and also in terms of biologicals there are new systems of delivery of medicines so that is one level of research and then we have the downstream part of research where much of this research then is translated to the systems of industries and other bodies so this is one part of the research but when we look at innovation it should look at it it the stip policy has has the unique advantage of looking at across the board innovation so in terms of preventive health care what better can be done so in terms of preventive health care maybe we can look at innovation in terms of uh, other housing strategies in terms of maybe having better cycle paths for uh, the children and others to so that we are people are more physically active have less pollution because there will be reliance on other modes of transport so when we are informing policy in terms of innovation it can the preventive part is equally important as the curative and the rehabilitative part of healthcare and uh, having said that innovation is um, is something that that is inbuilt into the way we handle things and it is a i think the, the greatest uh, uh, encouragement the science and technology policy could give us to throw open this uh, innovation uh, 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 for for others to be able to uh, uh, to be able to engage in the process and, and and actually see the outcome of the innovation process so uh, i think when we look at innovation it is a very wide gamut we also need to look at all these young researchers in the various universities across the board how are they engaging in innovation and what is it that we can do to encourage them to bring their ideas uh, up on the field in terms of innovation there's a lot of information that is also available uh, if we look at the uh, medicines drugs vaccines and devices even if you look at the curative part There's a lot of information that is available on, say, patent databases across the world. We can look at those databases and design around them and bring better products onto the market. So there is a whole scope that is possible under the uh, policy, and I think that uh, the, the way the uh, consultative process is going on, it will give us light uh, with different ideas coming forward to be able to uh, harness this, uh, these different ideas and bring them up. on board so when we look at health both the preventive the policy aspect in all the ministries they mentioned the uh, uh, the one health policy and the uh, the animal the uh, agriculture the human health coming together innovation across that aspect of the board and also uh, uh, given the, the gamut in terms of curative power what i do want to say is that it's such a very big bandwidth so the policy has to be an enabler to enthuse this in the system and then it will happen after all it is our own people who are leading some of the the uh, the nadelas and the sundar pichais are 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 people who who we produced in our country so really we need to uh, get get the innovation 
uh, uh, ecosystem going. And then I think a lot of our aspects will, will be, able to, uh, be able to be handled. Not just health innovation, we couldn't go beyond that as well. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shreve. As always, you bring forward some very interesting practical examples think on that line. Thank you so much for that. So uh, with that, I'll move to Dr. Gupta. Uh, here's a question um, I would like uh, to hear from you. So this is from Sanjukta, and we got it from YouTube maybe. Yeah, so the question is, how do you build in ethical health data sharing and ensure data security as well? So it's about ethical data sharing and, uh, and at the same time ensuring data security. Over to you, Dr. Gupta. Uh, this was a question more suited for NCMAR, but uh, I will try attempt to answer that. Um, ethical uh, data sharing is empirical. It is something which we have to look at, uh, given that we are moving to artificial intelligence in healthcare. We are looking at uh, data which will be digitized more and more healthcare data, data will be digitized and what are the privacy concerns i do not know or i would not want to share with the world my health status i wouldn't want to know so anonymizing and ethical sharing of data is imperative how we protect it and how we uh, take care of uh, the health data of uh, the citizen is very very important not only in the in the context that i wouldn't want uh, the people to know it is how my data can be exploited by um, the industry the health industry the insurance industry uh, the uh, travel industry how can that data be uh, exploited by these various uh, people out there I I could be targeted for uh, um, by the healthcare industry for products which I may not need. But given that my health profile uh, puts me in that target uh, audience, they would target me with that. You know, the insurance company would uh, uh, take advantage of uh, the information which is available uh, with them. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are various ways uh, the data can be misused and misread. So uh, ethics and protection of uh, health data is very, very important. And I think ICMR is looking into that uh, very carefully. And uh, maybe Chandra uh, Shekhar might want to add more on that, uh, to that. Yes, uh, Dr. Chandra Shekhar, uh, could you please give your comments on this? Yes, sir. It's yeah. I think what Shelja has said is very, very important. There, there are two things that one is a, the personal health data and the data that we collect over a period of time for different clinical trials and other trials is something that has to be segregated. Uh, personal health data is a very, very sensitive thing in different settings and in different communities and in different regions and countries. One has to take a very, very calculated and a balanced decision as to how much and to whom can this be shared. This could be useful for planning purposes as well as the governments are concerned for giving it to other people for their own uh, economic and own uh, fiscal uh, benefits and considerations is something that needs to be looked at very, very carefully. One has to take a balanced uh, decision and the decisions will keep changing over different periods of time in coming years. But one has to be very, very careful as to how much and to whom to share the kind of data that we are looking at. Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. We now move to Dr. Manisha. And Dr. Manisha, this is a question coming from uh, our social media YouTube platform. Uh, so the question is basically, what are the areas of the health diplomacy that needs to be changed or strengthened? And can STEP play a role in that? If yes, what can, could be the enablers? So basically, what are the areas that need to be changed in the diplomacy? Yes, uh, in fact, uh, 
One of the uh, things that I, I had mentioned earlier as well is that India is a large supplier of generic medicines and we supply some of the best quality generic medicines across the globe. In fact, if you look at the supplies which go even to the uh, countries of the West, the European Union and the US, almost 40% of their generic uh, supplies are also from India because our products are, are uh, meet good quality uh, parameters. So uh, there has been a general demand from the uh, countries across the region that India supplies these uh, medicines and they are able, uh, they are avail made available to the countries uh, across uh, the, the, beyond India. And that is where health diplomacy can play a large role, particularly for the smaller countries in terms of uh, the, uh, uh, the countries uh, uh, in our neighborhood like Bhutan and Maldives, there has been a consistent demand for, uh, for the supply of medicines. In fact, many of them are sourcing from India or in some cases in Maldives, the medicines actually go to Sri Lanka and from there then it is sourced to Maldives. And uh, so, what is important is to look at the kind of uh, the requirements and of, of these smaller countries. And it would be a big way for India to, uh, to be able to make these supplies available to the countries. And that is where the science and technology innovation policy can actually look at the availability and work closely with the health ministry. And also we may have to work across uh, the other ministries in terms of the ministries of commerce which are uh, in connect with institutions like the farm excel which are uh, engaged in terms of maintaining many of these databases one of the uh, uh, big challenges when we look at medicines in compared to uh, some other the other products for example uh, vaccines is more or less a closed system because you know how many children you want to be vaccinated at the end of the uh, of the year because you know the the number of doses that are likely to be uh, required this is not the case in terms of uh, when we look at drugs and generic supplies so often what happens is that there can be a huge demand of medicines at some point of time and then there is a lack of demand and so there is a needs to work through digital systems as well and to generate and look at demand supply situations as well. Having said that, we need to bear in mind that no medicine can be introduced in any country unless the respective drug regulatory agency approves that drug for use in that country. So it is important that we look at uh, regulatory uh, network collaboration and in this aspect, we uh, in the Southeast Asia region, uh, we have a Southeast Asia regulatory network where the 11 regulators of our neighboring countries, uh, including the three ASEAN countries, uh, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, and Myanmar, have come together for this purpose. And uh, there are, in fact, uh, five working groups which are looking at uh, regulatory collaboration to in, uh, through the WHO so that we can uh, access the access to drugs and vaccines and devices and diagnostics is maintained. So uh, this uh, collaboration is something which is ongoing and which is uh, uh, not very old. It started in 2017 with the first uh, connection being made in India. In fact, uh, uh, it's, it's a bit of an interesting story, the, the beginning of this collaboration, because during one of the consultations in Sri Lanka, there was a, a, a statement that a particular drug which came from India was not of good quality. And when we came back and we checked, we found that it was not a problem with the manufacturing of the drug, but it was a problem of the distribution and the fact that the drug remained on the port in Colombo for almost six months. As a result, the drug, uh, the, the tablets were no longer tablets, they had converted into a powder form. And so there was a, when the, when the information got across, the regulators got together and uh, India, Indonesia and Thailand felt that this would greatly influence and help in terms of introduction of good uh, products in the region. 
And this is work which is, it is actually work in progress. It is, a, it is in fact, um, we were hoping to have uh, engaged in, in, with Indonesia this year and develop the next steps, but for the COVID-19. But currently we are, there is some, uh, quite a lot of work going on in terms of regulatory uh, uh, collaboration and also to improve the accessibility across the region. One of the important points that came out in terms of medical devices was also the CE certification and also can be improved uh, uh, simplified forms. So if the industry has to apply for uh, uh, in a particular uh, jurisdiction, the, the simplification of forms and common forms uh, will also help in terms of improving accessibility of these drugs. So to, to, to um, summarize, so there are two aspects to it. There is the actual delivery and movement across the uh, boundaries, which is the physical aspect, but also drug regulatory approvals which will contribute to better availability of uh, the drugs and the products uh, in, in these different countries. So some of it is work in progress, but through the science and technology uh, innovation policy, we could look at better digital systems and better data availability and relating it with uh, 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 back with the uh, demand and supply uh, positions and uh, perhaps one way of moving forward would be to take it up in a in a pilot phase and then uh, enlarge that and this could also uh, not only greatly uh, help uh, the countries uh, uh, of the region, but also you mentioned the concept of health diplomacy. This is uh, a good we would be doing in the long run as well. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for the in the detailed insight. And as always, it's a really pleasure to listen to you. And I uh, hope the audiences are also having great time listening to your practical experiences and putting things the way you put things in perspective. So it was really wonderful. Uh, with that, I'll move to our next question, uh, which um, I believe has been uh, uh, put forward uh, based on a recent unfortunate event that happened in the country with one of our celebrities. So, and I'll keep this open question op open to um, all of our uh, panelists. Anyone uh, of you who would wish to answer it could go ahead. Uh, so this is about mental health care. And um, the person who is asking is Atandra Chaudhary. And uh, uh, the question is that whether mental, when we talk about health policy, uh, although we are talking about uh, STI policy here, but um, uh, the person that wants to know that when we talk about health policy in general, does it only take physical health care or does it take care mental health care as well? And if so, what are the preventive mental health care uh, that could be, you know, incorporated in a policy. So I hope uh, I was able to get the message across. Over to you. Dr. Chandra Shekhar, Dr. Sridhar, uh, anyone? Dr. Gupta? Well, I yeah, can anyone? definitely <laughs> say that mental health is part of healthcare. And it is, there have been a number of World Health Assembly resolutions also that have addressed the issue of mental health care. This is uh, uh, something which has come up uh, uh, even in the national health policy. There is the 2017 policy in India also makes a reference to it. And so mental and physical health, uh, health care all around is, a, is, is critical uh, in terms of uh, moving forward uh, it, it uh, mental health is a is is a is a is a more complicated uh, area to deal with because often if there are no outward symptoms it is difficult to engage uh, for for mental health care and for this we there are uh, specialized institutions and uh, uh, and the uh, it is encouraged that people approach the correct, the right psychologists who can help anybody who is in a situation of mental health and, and needs help. Having said that, uh, the society and community, including uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
the community health care and primary health care is also needs to uh, gear up to be able to handle uh, mental health. And uh, uh, as I have mentioned, that the countries across have come together in various World Health Assembly resolutions. It is not a subject that I deal with personally, so I don't have uh, 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 more up-to-date information, but there is certainly a lot of work which is happening in the countries and internationally as well. I know, for instance, that Bangladesh has been leading a number of uh, initiatives on this uh, because uh, the Prime Minister has been deeply uh, concerned on this uh, area, but I am not uh, current with the latest initiatives. Maybe Dr. Chandrasekhar might like to add a little more. Over to you. Yes, Dr. Chandrasekhar, please go ahead. Yeah, very rightly said that uh, there is no health, with, no health which is complete without mental health. Mental health is the integral part of the human system, and it needs more attention than the physical health that we need to be very, very acutely aware of. The efforts have been made to make this as an integral part in the healthcare delivery system at all levels. Of the mental problems, the depression is one thing that is very, very silent and people suffer without realizing that they have depression. There are different initiatives at different levels to train the health workers in identification of depression, early stages of depression so that it can be it can be spotted, it can be uh, treated, and it should be something that we should be very, very acutely aware of. Apart from depression, there are other mental illnesses which have stigma. People don't come, people don't share even their feelings with the family, what to talk about sharing that with the provider and the physician at different levels. They, the stigma attached to any mental health problem is something that we need to be very, very aware of and should have counselors at different levels which can take care of this and we support the patient as well as the families to take care of the family members who go into the stages of depression and bipolar disorders and other disorders. There are very good efforts being made by ICMR also. We have a dedicated area specialist in this who looks after coordinating mental health research in the country. We also collaborate very, very closely with Nim Hans in Bangalore, who devise different strategies and the modules which can be which can be implement at, implemented at different levels of health. So thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Indeed, mental health has been always important, but definitely it has with some of these recent cases, it has again taken a priority. Uh, we move to Dr. Uh, uh, Shalja now. And Dr. Shalja, there is a question that has been posed from Varun Bhaskar on our social media. And the question is that the, the, um, Varun wants to have some information about the current disease surveillance infrastructure uh, across villages, towns, and cities. And are there, so he wants, and he also poses a related question that are there any ideas on innovations which can help here in the disease surveillance infrastructure? So, uh, the, the, we uh, in the office of ESA did work with the, uh, a various institution in developing a model, a predictive model for uh, medical inventory. Uh, and uh, this uh, model was important to uh, be able to uh, tell the districts that uh, given the COVID situation, uh, not just uh, uh, across India, where, wherever we wanted to, uh, two district towns, uh, cities, uh, if uh, there was uh, X number of cases uh, in uh, your town or city, uh, this is the kind of readiness you would require. This is the kind of infrastructure you would require to uh, combat the disease. And this model uh, the, is called med medical uh, med inventory and is available there. And uh, it gives a, a idea to district uh, administrators uh, to be prepared for uh, the number of uh, ICU units they would need, number of uh, hospital beds they would need, the uh, kind of support systems they would need in terms of uh, the uh, 
COVID crisis, their uh, particular district may be facing in the future. So we, we have uh, been uh, looking at, uh, if I understand your question rightly, uh, we have been looking at uh, such uh, situations uh, and uh, predicting the infrastructure which is required. Um, and uh, it is very important for district uh, administration to be prepared for uh, the requirements in the, uh, in a situation uh, in a crisis in a health crisis uh, whether it is covid or any seasonal uh, diseases like uh, chikungunya and the uh, other uh, uh, seasonal crisis health crisis that we see every time uh, uh, these tools the tools which we create uh, are the tools which uh, uh, the uh, health uh, administrators can use to uh, combat the diseases. Um, they are uh, they can be uh, they can be used well, and they can be created uh, more create, uh, uh, in a more creative way, uh, looking at the needs and requirements of people and the districts. Uh, Divya, was that the question? Yes, so basically he was actually aiming uh, to have some information how, what could be the probable innovation tools, innovative tools. Yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, the mathematical model is required, uh, requiring, uh, the, I, I can just mention, I think I did mention uh, the kind of uh, uh, innovation models that we can uh, look at. And uh, it, I, I would suggest, uh, Varun, his name was Varun. Yes, Varun. His Varun Bhaskar. Yes. Uh, Varun Bhaskar, if he looks at the med inventory and see how it is uh, done, we would like to have his uh, feedback on uh, on the med inventory and if he has suggestions as to how we can make it better. Uh, so we that, connect, him, uh, connect him to the team who has uh, developed the model, the predictive model. Sure, sure. This is insightful actually for Varun. I hope Varun has got the right way to go ahead now. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Yes. Thank you, yes. Dr. Gupta, for addressing the question so nicely. Uh, so yes, moving to the next question, I think um, I'll uh, move towards uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar for this question. Uh, so this is uh, speaking in terms of the healthcare needs of the country. What role STIP like STI policy can play in achieving self-reliance. Uh, that is our goal towards Atma Nirbhar Bharat. Dr. Chandrasekhar, please. Yeah, this question can be taken in two ways. One is the one is to enable the Indian people and the scientists to innovate to and which is cost effective. But that would be not enough because you have to commercialize those technologies and those systems which can be which can be eventually used by people. So some of these innovations are self-contained and they can be used as it is, but some of these innovations would also require the use of bigger machines and with other technologies for them to be able to be given a good result and the eventual eventually the user usable kind of interpretation. That might take a little longer than what we can expect now because all those things have been there and to undo that and have a different technology and a different systems developed in-house in the country would take a little longer time. But I think we should make a sincere effort to do that. And I'm very happy to tell you that in the last five, seven years, the Indian scientists and the innovators have developed such fantastic innovations which are being used, which have been commercialized, but not the higher innovations which are already in use, which are imported and they have already established. To undo that and to re-establish ourselves in that area would be a little challenge. It is possible, but it will take a little longer than what we can think right now, but definitely that will happen. For that, we will have to have definitive policies from the government for the incentivization and make the industry also responsible and responsive to the needs so that they also pitch in some money, we also pitch in some money so that eventually we come to a product 
which is made in India, which can be used by the people at a very, very affordable price that is possible. Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, the next question uh, is uh, for Dr. Sridhar. Dr. Sridhar, uh, the question that has come up is, uh, do you think there is a need to bring more focus to the indigenous technologies and frugal innovation? And if yes, what step could, how step could play, play a role in that? Over to you, Dr. Sridhar. Yeah, I uh, I agree with the question, and I actually wouldn't like to call any innovation as frugal innovation. Innovation is innovation, and uh, what we uh, need to do is to make the connect with the from the innovation stage to the market and availability, and uh, uh, making sure that the innovation is brought in brought into practice. So, uh, but yes, there has been classification on frugal innovation and often that classification is not, uh, uh, does not do justice to the innovation because it, uh, it uh, puts this innovation in a bracket, which is not innovation as of uh, an innovation of at a, maybe at a different, uh, better level. So uh, my first uh, uh, connect on this would be that the innovation should be treated as innovation and every innovation deserves the same degree of respect that, uh, that any innovation deserves. But what happens is that certain innovations are not able to see the marketplace and the connect between the, uh, uh, the, uh, the innovator and the, and the uh, manufacturer or the private marketplace is, is where we need a greater uh, uh, effort. And that is something that even Dr. Chandrasekhar mentioned a few minutes ago when he was talking about how uh, products need to be brought to the market. In this, uh, uh, STIP can play a very big role. In fact, if you look at the Asian economies of Japan earlier and then Taiwan and also uh, China, which was very recent. Vietnam is doing very well in terms of moving up on innovative practices. So uh, if there is a policy incentive and a, and a speed to innovation, which the STIP will, will hopefully provide. And I'm, I'm quite confident that given the deep consultations, we will reach there because we have some of the finest people engaged in this process. So that needs that bridge and that divide needs to be brought about uh, uh, the, uh, to cover it over with a bridge and make sure that the innovation is brought into uh, into use. And uh, for this purpose, we apart from uh, STIP uh, policy uh, in terms of what is needed uh, for the innovator, I think uh, a lot of uh, 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 some part, I hope one of the tracks of STIP will also be looking at what does the manufacturer need in terms of making that innovation available and, and making that connect with the, with the innovator so that we address both sides of, of the coin. And this can be something as to where we have been talking for many years in terms in the government when we talk about um, a single uh, uh, a window clearance policy from all departments, but that has never happened. So, uh, you know, in terms of making processes easier for the manufacturer to be able to connect with the innovator and then produce the prototype and to be able to uh, make sure that, that the product comes into the market. So uh, I, I think the whole gamut needs to be addressed and a policy is a, is a guiding document. One of the very interesting things uh, which we see in terms of many, uh, some of the countries is, for example, in Europe, in the EU, we have the horizon uh, policy, the horizon 2020, and it is being devised. So I think there is also a need to look at uh, the STIP as a policy, not as, as, as something that is uh, sacrosanct for 2020, but can we look for an, for an advisory capacity to continuously make the policy vibrant and make it more uh, aligned with the needs as we go along. Maybe an advisory group uh, 
uh, looks at that policy and 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 engages with it over the period of implementation and make sure that say after four or five years if we want to recast the policy and and to make it more and to uh, and to make it more relevant to the then needs we should be in a position uh, to make a continuous improvement as we as we do so because as we know nothing is static uh, and everything uh, and environment keeps changing just three months back and we never things were so different and COVID 19 has changed everything upside down and we are now looking at a different world and we talk about a new normal and and even in terms of connecting this is i think we're all getting very uh, smart on using uh, technology such as web-based uh, uh, engagement which we are doing today so so it we need a continuous engagement uh, at every level to make sure that this connect actually happens over to you thank you dr Sridhar, for this amazing uh answer to the question and i think you just gave forward many points which could directly go as inputs to the policy making process uh, so with this uh, the next question is on ways to wealth ways to wealth mission and i think dr gupta is the best person to answer that so uh, the question is how to connect it to uh, how to connect the ways to wealth mission uh, to the step 2020 uh, process maybe in the health perspective or maybe in general Dr. Gupta? Yes. Uh, I think waste management, like I said right in the beginning, health is not in isolation. Everything contributes to a health and waste more than anything else. The pandemic, the crisis which we are seeing at this moment is due to the mismanagement of waste as we see it uh, happening. To say that it happened in China and that it will not happen in India is being foolhardy. Uh, if you go to Ghazipur waste uh, landfill, uh, we have the landfill, we have a, a, a slaughterhouse right next door, and we have a dairy farm like, right next door. It is a crisis waiting to happen. Uh, the next pandemic is could be from the Gazipur landfill site. So waste is, and the pollution it generates, it creates, whether it is water pollution, whether it's air pollution, or whether it is soil pollution, is inherently and, integ and integrated into health systems. We cannot do away without uh, uh, ignoring waste and expecting a better health system to flourish in India. Uh, it is imperative that we look at our, our waste well and treat it well and get rid of the uh, humongous amount of waste which we see uh, in uh, every nook and corner of this country uh, if we do not, uh, if we want better health care systems to uh, evolve. Healthcare systems do not um, just evolve uh, by uh, creating uh, a hospital or uh, uh, a clinic, but the whole uh, interdisciplinary science, which uh, uh, was uh, alluded to uh, right in the beginning, is uh, the crux of better health care systems. And it is important that we set every aspect of our environment right uh, by uh, looking at waste, uh, which is uh, polluting our land, water, and air, to the extent that it is one of the major, um, uh, major uh, contributor to our health uh, uh, and disease burden in the country. And uh, till we uh, address uh, uh, the pollution created by waste, uh, we will not be able to uh, create a better health system in India. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gupta. And uh, we uh, can, I, can I ask you people a little bit here? Uh, I mean, uh, questions which uh, the audience are asking us. So let's break this a little bit. Uh, and uh, does the audience uh, have any suggestions to give us as to yes. how? we can make the healthcare system better. Uh, I mean, 
uh, we keep pontificating all the time and I'm sure we are saying same things which hundreds of other people have already said it in different ways. Can the audience give us what is that one thing that we can do better to make our uh, s &T's policy uh, in healthcare uh, really great? Uh, in fact, when you say this, uh, I suppose that's giving us a new perspective because now, uh, as this would, this is not a single webinar today. In fact, a 14 in series that we'll be doing as part of this consultation. Let's go back to our audiences from and ask them not to just kind of shoot the questions, rather than to come up with ideas as well, which we could kind of discuss during our uh, discussion panel, as you say. So maybe yeah, I would. Yeah, Divya. Uh, yeah, I would like to join in here. A uh, very nice point that Dr. Gupta has raised. And in fact, uh, we, in this particular track, we have the public engagement process through various other modes that we are also doing through the Science Policy Forum uh, platform that we have. So this is one mode, and through other modes, we uh, all the audiences who are with us today uh, are uh, like you have this opportunity to put your ideas, put your questions, put your ideas uh, to, uh, forward to us, so, so that it would um, give it it can uh, go into the policy making process of the step 2020. And that was the larger idea behind uh, opening this track of public consultation. Over to you, Divya. Yes, so rightly said, we'll have lots of surveys, we have lots of podcasts and uh, major activities designed through which we are kind of collecting the inputs from the larger public, which will be the basically the effectors for this policy. So Dr. Gupta, I'll just uh, uh, pose uh, another follow up of the last question that uh, you just answered for the innovation. So basically, Varun wants to know more about the uh, the he wants to have some innovative ideas which are kindly in build up mode for monitoring outbreaks rather than managing them so basically how what the innovative ideas into continually monitoring these outbreaks and anticipating and predicting future outbreaks so what are those innovative ideas that could be that are basically right now being implemented across villages towns and cities I think uh, in terms of predicting outbreaks, uh, uh, I, and uh, DST actually has started our uh, uh, initiative called the Super Model, and which is going to look at the surveillance and the uh, history and the pattern of uh, disease outbreaks, uh, uh, COVID being one uh, example, but looking at other diseases also, so that predictive models can come up uh, in terms of uh, 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 decent weeds or uh, cholera, uh, what, when do we expect a disease uh, to uh, or when uh, do we uh, expect a disease to spread and how do we expect a disease to spread? These are uh, models which uh, are given their own setup. Uh, Varun can, uh, where, does, uh, where does Varun come from? Uh, wherever uh... you're muted you're muted just his name that i can see right now is not his location maybe he can post his location and we can yeah i mean it doesn't matter whichever city or whichever town he comes in from he could look at which is the major disease which affects the uh, his city and uh, look at the spread. Uh, does it happen during uh, rain, uh, the monsoons? Does it happen during winters? Does it happen during summers? And uh, sort of get try and get data. Data is going to be a big challenge. Data is always a challenge. Prediction is based on data. Till the time we do not have enough data, it is very difficult to predict. But he's a youngster, uh, presumably a young uh, man who's trying to cre create uh, predictive models. He can look at uh, small models, look at uh, tools, whether it works for him, uh, uh, validate that predictive model. Does it work year after year? Does it work season after season? And uh, we can, uh, and as we know, artificial intelligence uh, as uh, uh, 
the more data we feed into it, the machine learns more, the uh, model learns more, it becomes better and better in its prediction. Uh, there's so many things he can uh, do uh, in terms of uh, what he wants to do in, uh, in, uh, in innovating, in predicting, in uh, trying to uh, get uh, uh, the disease spread uh, and uh, help the administration uh, with his models. Or, uh, I, and I think there is a huge need for that. Uh, in this country. Every year we have dengue breaks, we have uh, cholera outbreaks, but uh, we do not uh, have a system which uh, predicts these outbreaks. And if we have a system which is there and which can be perfected over season after seasons, I think that would be a great help to uh, administrators, uh, health administrators, to district administrators, to town uh, administrators. I think there is a huge scope for innovation there. Yes, there is. He needs to have his maths and statistics. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we have uh, Dr. Rajnikant uh, Shivastav from ICMR joining us uh, now. Uh, Dr. Rajnikant, could you please uh, switch on your camera so that the audience uh, are able to see you? Camera, there's some problem. Okay, no, no problem, sir. Then we would maybe, because uh, we are moving towards the end of the session, uh, maybe we would like to hear uh, an overall uh, comment from you, uh, and which could be a closing note from you. So could you please go ahead? Hello? Um, I think there's some uh, connectivity issue uh, at his yes. end. Yes, oh, yes, okay, please we'll go ahead. Go ahead with your program. Okay, sir. Would you like to give a closing note? No, no, Dr. Chandrasekhar will give. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Then. Okay. okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, then, uh, Divya, should, uh, I think we should move ahead with the closing notes yes. part of the program. Uh, so, so, we have another five or eight minutes. So, let's take up uh, one or two questions more. I think I have another question which uh, seems to be from the post that we have received. There seems to be a little confusion between the national health policy and the science technology innovation policy. I have this question from Dr. Chandrasekhar, and I'd like to hear from you, sir. So what uh, uh, the idea is that there are these two policies. Uh, so what are the different domains that the STI policy needs to emphasize in na of the national health policy, and whether these domains would complement the existing national health policy of India? You see, the thing is that the health policy is an overall arching statement which defines the health that we need, health of the people that we need to address in the next five, seven years. Without innovations, health policy will not be able to function because the innovations have to complement the <clears throat> efforts of the government in making the technologies and the treatments affordable to the people. So that is the crux. We have to have a innovation policy which will complement the needs of the health policy so that we are able to address the illness, health, and other related issues in a much, much more meaningful manner, which is cost effective, which the program and the people at large are able to accept are able to afford. That is the essence of amalgamation of the innovations which will be supplemental to the goals and the objectives of the health policy. That is that is how it has to be looked into and that is it that is how it has to be addressed and that is it has to be implemented. That is all that I would want to say as a, as a closing point. Thank you Dr. Chandrasekhar for your insights. And uh, sadly enough, we are moving towards the end of this very engaging session that we had. Uh, while uh, towards moving towards the end, we would like to have short closing notes from uh, each of our panelists. Uh, could we start with maybe Dr. Sridhar? Could you please go ahead? 
Yeah, thank you. I do want to say that somewhere in the policy, we need to reflect the amount of uh, funds that will be available for science and technology innovation and to promote uh, innovation uh, across the board and particularly in public health. In fact, uh, when we were engaging in uh, the WHO uh, with for the consultative expert working group, uh, we found that uh, uh, it, in the National Institutes of Health, uh, they promote research in a very big way. And I think it was in the year 2012, uh, the CEWG report came out in WHO. And at that time, they had said that uh, they were, uh, US was spending about 0.01% of their gross domestic product, the GDP, on innovation and promoting uh, 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 in, in terms of moving forward on innovation in public health and health-related aspects. So I think we, uh, when we design this policy, at some stage there should be, there would be a finance committee that looks uh, at what needs to be done in terms of resources to be made available for public health. And having said that, my second uh, 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 point of concern is that uh, I think we need to make research and innovation uh, a very attractive field for young researchers to, to feel proud of the fact that they are, they are innovators. And for that, uh, one of the ways is that within the universities and other systems, we do need to create this, uh, 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 some kind of an innovation hub, which actually promotes uh, researchers to to, uh, to give their best minds in terms of innovation. And to do that also, we need, uh, I think the government needs to look at financial resources to make that happen. So when we look at public health uh, uh, aspects, I think uh, the public health uh, and health related innovation uh, has a bearing on, on a very large uh, aspects uh, of the science and technology innovation policy having uh, a connect with a number of domains. And this is something that needs to be borne in mind when we also look at next steps and how to make the policy uh, actually work and, and deliver. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for your closing remarks. Uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, can we uh, have your closing remarks for the session, please? Uh, we yes. have said what we need to say is that science and technology innovation policy has to be subservient to the goals and the objectives of the health policy. That is what we are aiming at. And the goals of the health policy are to make available, affordable, and the best care to the, to the last person in the is that is what we are looking for. And I think everybody is trying to do their bit of share and trying to promote whatever best can be done in the limited resources. And I would want to agree with Manisha by saying that we have to be a little more pragmatic and realistic in terms of allocation of money for promoting and taking the innovations forward, because that is going to give us very, very rich dividends, which will be, which will be supplemental to the efforts and the monetary allocation that the government is doing is something that we need to be very, very acutely aware of. And I think there is a realization vote at the level of the government as well as all the other planners. They are moving in this direction. And in the coming years, we see something good happening to the people and the program for this country. That is what my, my wish is. And I think we will be able to succeed in this. Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, Dr. Gupta? Please give your uh, closing remarks. Um, I think I, uh, what uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar said about uh, the STI policy being subservient to the health policy is Freudian. Uh, actually, innovation, SMT innovation will be, will continue being subservient to the health policy because the regulations need to be relaxed within the Ministry of Health and ICMR. The 
regulations are stifling the creativity of the young and we need to rehaul and reorganize the regulatory policies of the country that is one uh, and uh, if we continue um, with our uh, very archaic and conservative regula regula regulatory po policy we will not stimulate innovation uh, uh, in within the minds of uh, our uh, researchers because they're bogged down with a regulatory policy which does not allow them to think out of the box because there are too many clearances, too many approvals needed before they can even start thinking of new ideas. Uh, one. The second, uh, I think about the investment, I, I slightly disagree with both Manisha and Chandrasekhar. Uh, well, India has invested a lot in startups, in innovative minds, and some of it is bringing uh, 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 the fruits uh, of uh, the investment which has been made over these years uh, uh, through the startup uh, ecosystem being created. I think the ideas uh, are coming out and good ideas. The problem with what I see here is the ideas are not in original. They are not something which are uh, looking at uh, the problems of India and providing solutions uh, which need to be uh, Indian solutions. Most of the ideas which are uh, being, uh, uh, which are coming into the market are uh, what I call me too ideas, ideas uh, and uh, solutions which are already available within the developed world and which now are uh, uh, being rehashed and uh, repackaged into Indian systems. So, I think, uh, and for that, no policy, nothing will make a difference till the mindsets and the creativity of Indian minds uh, looks at the question, uh, looks at the environment, ask, her, ask us a question, why is this waste here? What can I do to make this waste go away? Why is, uh, why is uh, the air quality so bad? What can I do uh, to make it better? Why is the water uh, which is coming from my tap is of such poor quality? What I can, what can I do to make that uh, water uh, better? Uh, how can I make this uh, health, uh, the uh, health of my soil better? This, uh, there's so many questions which our environment provides us, and which only we have the solutions for. Uh, given our uh, system. So uh, the the Indian uh, mindset has to change and we have to start thinking of questions which uh, matter to us and answering those questions in a way which we uh, should be uh, answering to. So policy is in one place, but uh, the ecosystem, the environment, the mindsets are a different uh, uh, ball game altogether and which needs uh, to, uh, a more uh, creative thought and a more engaging thought within the young uh, and uh, and we hope that uh, a more uh, engaging uh, and that's why I, I uh, and that's why it's important to engage with uh, our youngsters just not have them ask questions but ask them what is it that they would want to do, what is it that they would like to see happening, uh, a, a more more proactive engagement in that sense, so that a, a dialogue is uh, set into uh, being and we can have a more uh, proactive uh, dialogue with the young and see how dramatically we can change the whole science, technology and innovation policy, uh, which will have real impact uh, on uh, ground. Otherwise, we will keep doing the same things in the same way over and over again and expecting change to happen, not likely, not likely to happen. So we have to think differently, do things differently, and have our science and uh, science technology and innovation policy, which is completely different and not uh, the same thing being said in a different way. That is so, so I yes, yes, Dr. Gupta. So I must say that, uh, so as we end on a very motivational note and also uh, uh, 
to the to sum up uh, we take lot of lot many enablers from this thematic panel today for our uh, policy discussions further so as we end i take this opportunity to thank our panelists dr shalja gupta dr manisha shridhar professor reddy our representatives from icm icmr dr chandrashekhar and dr rajnikant for taking out their time for the panel discussion today and uh, more importantly the discussion would not have been fruitful without uh, the enthusiastic participants of our panelists and our audience our audience who asked some great questions on step 2020 on behalf of everyone here at science policy forum i would like to thank the larger team that has enabled this event today while the curtain draws on our first thematic panel today please note that we have 14 more coming up in this series from tomorrow so do watch our website for more details on the panel discussions and get involved thank you again and have a very good night thank you thank you everyone thank you and th thank you to the young girls you've done a good job